Hello, this is Al Judge. Welcome to another lesson from my book, From Photos to Art with Photoshop. Okay, in this video we're going to be focusing on the toolbar down the left side of the workspace. And the first item on the list here is the Move Tool. Now that can be used to move one layer relative to another. Unfortunately right now we don't have a second layer. But let me just throw something in here. Uh, jump ahead a little bit and I'll just do a uh, type layer and I'll just put some text in here we'll come back and explain this better later just say chapel so I've just identified this as a chapel and when I click that the words there and now with the move tool I can move that word around any place I want. Basically do anything with it. If it was an object, I could do the same thing. I could could move it anywhere relative to this background image. So we'll we'll come back to this later as we do other things. We'll be using the move tool quite a bit. One of the things that's nice about it is when you have the move tool um highlighted here. You can use your keys on your keyboard to fine-tune that position of whatever it is you're trying to move. So um, that's all we're going to talk about with the move tool for the moment. We'll be using it throughout the examples and uh, you'll see it in action a lot more. I'm going to just delete this extra layer And we'll continue on down the toolbar. The next three groups of icons are selection tools. And a selection in Photoshop is a way of telling Photoshop to treat a portion of the image different than everything else. And each of these is a group of icons because we have a small triangle, triangle down here in the lower right hand corner which always tells you there's more items in that group. So I'm just going to click on each one of these and we'll talk about them a little. The ones we're going to be talking about in the lesson from this first group are the rectangular marquee and the elliptical marquee tool. Now these are selections made in a very um, rigid geometric way. They're uh, very absolute. As we'll see with some of the other, some an example of what marquee tools do, I will use the elliptical marquee. So I'm going to create an ellipse and I'm going to start out here somewhere and I'm just going to drag to create an ellipse. And now I can move that around a little to grab part of this chapel. And as you can see, the outline of that ellipse looks like it's moving. And this is where it gets the name Marquee. And likewise, because of the way this is done, it looks like the segments of this ellipse are moving around the outline. The other name that is commonly used in Photoshop for this effect is Marching Ants. And in general, a marquee or a marching ant outline indicates a selection. Now, it's not just for the marquee tools, it's for other tools. What's unique about the marquee tools is that this is a clearly defined area that's being selected. There's no doubt about the limits of it. It's, it's geometrically defined, and the same thing would be true if we had chosen the rectangular marquee tool. So for the moment, I'm going to just deselect that area so it's no longer selected. We'll move to a different set of tools. And there are three tools here. And these are the lasso tools. And I'll start with the first one on the list, the lasso tool to show you basically how that works. So I said this is not as rigidly defined. 
So when we use this lasso tool, we just want to basically identify the area that we want to select. And we can pretty much move it around any way we want and make a much looser and more complex selection. Now again, you see the marching ants around here. But the thing is, it doesn't clearly define or rigidly define the edges of whatever you're selecting. And you'll need to come back and refine that later, and we'll be talking about that a lot as we go through the lessons. So again, I'm going to get rid of this one. Select, deselect. No longer have a selection, and I'm going to go to a different lasso tool. And this is called a magnetic lasso tool. And this works differently than the lasso tool, and then it's going to attempt to find the edges and snap to the edges, just like um, a magnet would snap the metal. So I'm going to start down here in this corner, and I'm pointing that out because one of the idiosyncrasies about this particular tool is you cannot close the lasso unless you come back to the exact starting point. So you like to put it somewhere where you can easily define it. Okay, we're going to start right down in this corner, and I want to stay a little to the outside of the edge of this chapel. And as I come up here with my cursor, you'll see it depositing little squares along that edge. Now this is a little... that. The first side that went up was a little difficult for Photoshop to identify the edge. But coming down the side here, it's very clearly defined, and you'll see it'll snap pretty nicely. We just get a bunch of squares along the edge. As we come up here, we'll get a similar effect. Come right down that rock. And we're back to our starting point. So again, we have a selection made, which is pretty good over here, but not so great on this side. Fortunately, we have another selection tool called the Quick Selection Tool. And this is a brush type tool, and the, the cursor is basically the size of the brush. And uh, for this case, we probably want to make it a little smaller. It is fortunate that you can use different selection tools together to refine your selection. Often, the quick selection tool will be your best choice for modifying a selection, even if it was made with a different tool. So in this case, we're going to, we, we made a selection that includes this chapel area basically but we want to we want to add to it along this edge because we didn't do a real good job and we want to subtract from here so up here we have icons this is first one is the original selection second one is add to the selection and the third one is subtract from selection so we're going to come to add to selection and we're just going to go up this line and Photoshop is going to attempt to correct and find that edge. Now again, the definition isn't so great over there, so it it didn't do a perfect job once again, but fortunately we can do subtract from selection. And when we do, you'll see it gets a little better it sort of learns what edge you're really looking for. So we've done fairly well. We'll pick up that. And also, like I mentioned, we'd like to remove that area from the selection. So we just drag over the areas we don't want and we refine our selection. As you can see, it jumped much further than I want. I can just go here and step backwards and try once again to refine that selection a little better. Sometimes the best way to do this is just put your cursor in the area you want and click. And it'll help refine that edge. Now again, it made a big jump there. and Like we showed before, we can always go back. 
But I think you get the principle here where you can just go back and forth between these different tools and refine your selection. Now there's another t selection tool here, a group with the quick selection tool, the magic wand. And the magic wand is going to look for a color. So if I just click in the sky area, you'll see the magic wand picked up most of the sky. Now it only goes as far as it can till there's a change of tone. And also how picky it is about that change is defined by the tolerance. So for a tolerance of 32, we got that far. Now I'm going to step back. I'm going to change this tolerance to 55. We're going to try that again. Click over here, and we got the entire sky. Likewise, if we had made this 5, step back, made it 5, and I click over here, see very small area. Again, click over here, even smaller area. So it's getting very picky about the color and tone. So let's go to 15 and try this again. And you can see we get a fairly large area when we do 15. So again, what, what the magic wand tool is doing, it's looking for a color and a tone. And it's going to be either very picky about it or not picky at all, depending on how you set the tolerance. The other thing you can do is you can, right now it's, it's click contigu contiguous, which means it will go until it finds an edge. If we didn't have that chosen, I'm going to change how I use this a little. I'm going to go back, get rid of that selection. Have it, it's non-contiguous. And if I click somewhere on this red rock, you'll see it's a pretty tight tolerance. And it'll just pick up little spots all throughout the rocks that have that particular color and tone. See some over here. So really, in this case, it just finds it wherever it is in the image, as opposed to when I have it on contiguous, It'll only go until it finds a line, um, an edge. You can change that to 30. Let's try that again. We'll go up here. I'm on contiguous. So it picks very small areas. Now I'll get rid of contiguous. And you can see it picks up a lot. And I'll pick a different color. And again, you can see quite picks up quite a bit. So I hope that that gives you an idea of what the magic wand will do. We've covered three groups of selection tools, the marquee tools, the lasso tools, and the quick selection tool with the magic wand. Next thing that we want to do is the, the crop tool. Again, this is one of a group of tools, but in these lessons, we're only going to talk about the crop tool. One of the things you'll, you'll discover as you work with Photoshop is if you forget to clear a selection like I just did, you can't really go forward until you clear that selection. Because as far as Photoshop is concerned, the only thing that exists is what's inside that selection area. And I'm just going to do, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit to grab a paintbrush here. And the color of the paintbrush is going to be white because that's the foreground color. We'll get back to that in a minute. But I just want to show you, if I start painting on here with white, you'll see absolutely nothing happen. Because Photoshop doesn't even consider the rest of this to exist. However, if I go over this small selection with, with the white, and I do that by pressing down on my mouse key, you'll see it turn white. 
entire area. Okay, before we can move forward, we first want to get rid of that white paint. So I go Edit, Undo Brush Tool, and it clears the white. And now we want to get rid of the selection. We go up to Select, Deselect. And now, if we were to paint, you'll see it's everywhere. Okay, I'm going to edit undo brush tool to get rid of that. And we're going to go back to the crop tool right now. Okay, so as I started to say earlier, we have a group of tools, but the crop tool is the only one we're concerned about. And when I click on it, it's going to draw a 4 by 5 ratio uh, border around here. And that's because that was the last thing I used. You can also clear this. And now if I come back and hit that, it'll grab the whole image. And I can crop by grabbing one of these handles and move it wherever I want. And I don't have to maintain any ratio. I can just crop in what I'd like to keep in my image. Also, once I've done that, I can move the image around within that box. And you'll notice there are lines drawn here. And these are the rule of thirds lines. If you're not familiar with that, it has to do with composition of images. And in general, images will look better if a main feature is along one of these lines. Whether it be the vertical or the horizontal line, or the intersection of several lines. So in this case, we would probably want to move it so that it aligned with the main feature aligned with one of these row of thirds um, lines. And up here on the options bar for the crop tool, we have an icon, um, a drop down menu, where we can actually change that grid. Like a, right now, like I say, it's a rule of thirds. But a very similar grid pattern called the golden ratio can be used instead. And some people prefer the golden ratio to the rule of thirds. Uh, but we're not going to get into that right now. I'm just going to go back and put it to the rule of thirds, which is what I usually use. So now, again, we had cropped this, but let's say we wanted to come back up and do an, say we decide we we're going to make this an 8x10 image, and we click on that. As you can see, it's showing 4x5 ratio. And we might like it in a vertical uh, pattern like this, but we might also like it to be more horizontal. In which case, we just flip the 4 and the 5 by clicking on this icon, and it turns. And now, we have that ratio, and if we move it, it'll maintain the ratio. We're making the box larger, but the ratio stays the same. So again, we can play around with it, we can move things around wherever we want, up, down, whatever behind that box. But when we go to crop this, it's going to cut off everything here that is sort of um, in the overlay area. It's a little uh, hazy. And it'll only maintain where the image is crisp. Now another important thing here is we want to make sure, in most cases, you want to make sure that this, is, this box is not checked. It says delete crop pixels. And if you check it, what's going to happen, if I were to hit this um, commit button, this check mark, to make that crop even happen, those pixels that are outside the image would be lost forever. Now, fortunately, I can always go back in Photoshop until I save the file, so I'm going to do that just to show you the implications. If if I wanted to, if I decided that maybe this isn't the way I want to crop it, and I come back and hit the crop tool again, and I make it larger, 
there is no image data to work with. I end up with a, a black border because my background color is black and it will just fill with that black color. So in some cases you may find this to be a good thing. But it's an easy way to make a black border. However, I'm going to go back here now. I'm going to undo. I'm going to step back. And I'm going to leave that unchecked. And we're going to come back here to the cropping again. And I'm just going to make a little adjustment there so we get the grid showing again. And I'll show you what happens this time when we click. Now we've chopped it off the same way as we did before, but now if we come back and we want to crop again, change the cropping, we still have image data that we can work with. And we can change the whole aspect ratio here. So again there's uh, much more that you can do if you don't if you don't click this. There's really not much reason to do it most of the time. So I would just stay away from that one. Okay we're gonna undo all this. Actually we come over here when uh, it's the cropping when this is the symbol we want to click on to get rid of that cropping, which it says cancel current crop operation. So we're going to do that. We're just going to hit the move tool to get rid of the cropping signs. In this book, in these lessons, we're not going to deal with the eyedropper tool, so I'm just going to skip over that. In some previous lessons, in fact, the introduction to this book, we talked about the spot healing brush tool. And if you recall, you can use it to touch up areas. And here's a place where let's say I want to get rid of that bush there. I can just drag over top of it. And it'll blend with its background. Now when you're close to an edge of something else, you sometimes have to work a little harder at it because the way Photoshop's going to sample the pixels is it's going to take some pixels from here and some pixels from there. So the closer you get to that dividing line, the harder it is to make a clean um, selection, um, healing selection. Okay, we're not going to, again, there are other tools in that group, and we talked in the, in the very first video, we talked about the Content Aware Move tool. We're not going to use that anymore, but if you, you don't remember that, um, you could go back to the first video, Chapter 1, and uh, take a look at that. Again, we're not going to use it anymore in these lessons. Now, the next item on the list is the brush tool. The brush tool is a big deal. And again, there's, there's four items here. We're only going to use the brush tool. When we click on that, you see the cursor turns to, which should be a circle, but it's not displaying quite as, a, as an even smooth circle right now. And the options bar has some different options associated with it. One of them is this drop down where I can change the size of that circle which is the brush size and as we get larger it looks more and more like a circle and this has to do with the resolution of the screen image that I'm using and we can also make that a hard brush or a soft one right now it's a very soft brush right now when we go to 100 percent it's a very hard brush a hard brush is going to give you very crisp lines. And a soft brush is going to act just like a soft paintbrush would. It, would. it gets fuzzy around the edges. Now, in addition to brush tips that look like a normal paintbrush, 
you can do some pretty clever things with this. Like for example, we have a pattern that is a maple leaf. And if we select that as our brush tip and we move, you'll see maple leaves everywhere. And I can make that larger so they're more visible. And likewise, we have some other patterns. This particular one looks like grass. And if I drag that across my image, it'll, it'll show blades of grass. I'm going to step back to that maple leaf for a moment. Now, when I drug that maple leaf across here before, you see a bunch of white maple leaves. That's because the foreground color is white. If I come in here and I change it to red, and I drag, see a bunch of red leaves. I can come in again and Choose another color as I drag it. Again, I get a different result. So there's quite a few things you can do with this paintbrush. Now the other thing is there's another icon here. If we hit that, we get a much bigger um, group of selections, things that we can do, and, and such things as it's previewing the current brush and showing you what, what it might look like as you drag it. So if I come up to some of these other tools that are more typical, we'll see, as I mentioned before, this is a soft brush, so it gives very soft edges. This is a hard brush, so it's very hard edges. And the brush tool area is something that you could spend a lot of time playing with. And it can be quite addictive. But I suggest instead of painting over a nice image like this, you have a blank paper or solid color background that you work on. Now fortunately, I have my history panel here. And I can go back and just put everything back to the way it was in the beginning. So I wasn't too concerned about that. The other thing when I was painting over with that is I could have added a new layer and worked on that layer instead. So now I'm just going to paint a little bit on that layer so you can see. And instead of going back in the history and, and getting rid of that, I could just turn off that layer. So a layer is like putting a piece of clear a transparent material over top of the image so that you're not actually painting on the image but you're painting on the surface above it. And uh, you can always turn that off anytime. Change it. And as I mentioned before, when the Move tool is active, you can just move that thing around wherever you want. Okay, we're going to turn that off and we're going to continue down the line. Now, the, the brush tool is a big deal, and we could devote a whole book to the brush tool. But for the purposes of getting started in Photoshop, just this overview should be enough. The next tool here is the clone stamp tool. And I'm going to switch images to, uh, to use that. Okay, this is an image of three hollyhocks on a black background. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to extend the canvas size. And right now that canvas size is a little more than 12 and a half inches wide. So I'm going to make the new width 26 inches six inches, leave the height as it is, 
and I'm going to add all the new canvas on the right side and I'm going to make it white. Okay, now if we go with the zoom tool, fit screen, we should see the whole thing. And now we're ready to use the clone tool here, clone stamp tool. So when I click on that, my cursor is turning to a round circle and I can move it anywhere I want. But I'm, I'm going to start up here in this corner and I'm going to hold down the Alt key for a minute. When I do, I get a target. And I like to set that target as close to that corner as I can. And then I'm going to click with my mouse. Now that I've done that, that is the starting point for the object to be cloned. And over here is the starting point for where I'm going to clone it. So you can see there's that little bit of dark area there inside the circle. And I'm going to come fairly close to this image so that I'll have enough room to work. And now when I click my mouse again, it's going to establish that location as the beginning the upper left hand corner of the new image because that was my starting point on the original image. As I drag along here you'll see it's filling in. You can see the crosshairs in the original image and where they are and they exactly duplicate what's being painted in the new image. So now as I move down into this first flower, you can see this is all yellow here in the middle from the crosshairs, and it's duplicating that on the right side. Now, I'm going to go up here and make this a much larger brush because I'm going to duplicate the entire image, and I don't need more precision than that. And you'll see I can draw that in very quickly. And I don't have to be particularly careful how I do it. I can release my mouse. I can come back and start over again. And it really doesn't matter because it's maintaining that relationship between the original image and the new one. And again, the distance between the crosshairs on the left and the center of the circle on the right will be constant, no matter how many times I release my mouse and start all over again. So we've duplicated that image rather quickly and easily. Now this is not something you do very often with the clone tool, but you can do it. Another thing that, um, a way to use it that is maybe a little more common, I'm going to pick another image so we can see this. This is um, shadow of an archway that hasn't been touched up at all. Nothing's been done to it yet. Um, but the, the big problem here is we've got this gap of sky up the top and generally the lightest thing in an image is going to draw your attention. So the eyes are going to be drawn to this area and that's not really what we want people looking at. So what we can do is we can use some of this foliage down the sides to help fill in up there. And again, we'll go to this clone stamp tool. But this time we want to have a much smaller cursor. And somewhere around there, maybe a little larger. Yeah, that's not bad. So we're going to grab a spot right here and we're going to come up here and duplicate that. And again, you can see how the crosshair is moving from the original position and the crosshair is moving from the new position. Probably want to get a little closer to this edge. I'm going to do that again. Grab another point and come up here and start filling in.
And maybe come over here and get a little bit of it. Grab there, come up here, fill in that gap. Come back down here, click again, fill in some here. And then as we start to fill in from the two sides, we can grab a spot up here, click, and now we can extend that over a little further. And we can continue that process until we get everything filled in the way we want. Now I'm going to zoom in for a moment. Now one of the advantages of picking from I'm going to go get my clone tool again, but picking from different spots is that you're less likely to have a duplication of a pattern that's obvious when people look at it. So I'm going to grab this and fill in there. Come down and grab another spot and fill in. Another. And notice as if I continue across I'll just start duplicating that the wall. And again, that's no big deal because I can wipe that out pretty quickly. I'm going to fill in that little gap. And I'm going to grab another piece over here and I'm going to cover up where that wall was. Okay, now you notice that as I did this, I'm going to zoom in one more time and make it really clear. But as I did this, I didn't worry too much about the lip here. Because now I can come back grab the clone tool again, place my target right on that edge, click, and now as I come across, I can even preview what it's going to do before I do it, but I can align my cursor with that upper edge, and as I pull forward, it'll just duplicate the, the trailing edge. And Smooth that out nicely. So with a little bit of practice, you can get pretty good at um, creating a convincing alteration to your image using this clone tool. Okay, so we're going to Drop that back to where you see the whole image. And as you can see, I could just continue along here and fill that whole area in. Okay, we want to move on to, we're going to skip this next group, and we'll just briefly talk about the eraser tool. This is a thing you won't need too often. Again, it's a brush type tool, so you can change the size. If I erase on any layer, other than a background layer, whatever I erase is going to become transparent. I'm going to start with, I'm going to duplicate the background layer so we can see the difference. Okay, I have two copies. This is the original background layer, and since it is the black background layer and it is locked, the first time we're going to erase on this background layer, and when we do, you'll see the area that we erased is turning black. And that's because the background color is black. Now if I switch this so that the background color is different, when I erase, that'll become the color that is visible. Now, with any other layer, and we're going to use the duplicate layer, you can see it's obscuring the background layer right now. 
and I'm going to turn off the background layer. So you can see it's only this background copy. Now if I erase, it becomes transparent. And this is what will happen on any layer other than the background layer. So now if I turn that back on, we can see the uh, background layer shining through. And also just another example, and since we have a couple layers, I'm just going to move this copy. And you can get an idea of its transparency. We're going to move on to the paint bucket tool. This is also in a group, but the paint bucket tool is the only one we're concerned with right now. And the paint bucket tool will replace any color you click on with the foreground color. So imagine that it's like having a paint, a paint bucket that's filled with black paint because that's the foreground color right now. And I'm on this I'm going to turn off the background and just have this copy showing. Let's say I picked these stones here. Now I have my paint bucket tool, which I know because I have the icon of the paint bucket showing. When I click on one of these stones, everything that's exactly that same color is going to turn black. Okay, I've got most of it. And just like we had before with the magic wand tool, we have a tolerance box up here. But let's let's make it 10%. And now I'm going to click in here again somewhere. And we've got most of this, but we also got items up here because we did not have the contiguous clicked. Okay, so I'm going to step back here a minute go back several times and I'm going to come in now with maybe let's say we set it to 15 and we make it contiguous meaning it will only go until it finds a nice edge so I'm just going to click in here somewhere and see all I'm doing is getting little dots little splotches. But if I unclick contiguous and I click in here, we're going to actually get items affected up in this image. Okay, so I'm going to back up again, show you another thing. Okay, now we want to make sure that we don't go beyond this line here. So one way we can do it is we can grab this marquee tool and we can make a selection. And now, as I mentioned before, as far as Photoshop's concerned, that selection is all that exists. So now if I take this paint tool, paint bucket tool, I can make this 50%. And when I click down here, it's only going to change that area. I'm going to select, deselect. When you use the paint bucket tool, it's going to cover everything that is that particular color or tone. The paint brush tool, on the other hand, will cover everything. Let's come up here and click on this background with the paint bucket tool, but first I'm going to hit contiguous. And we have 50%, so it's a good bit. And you can see most of that blue turned to yellow. I'm going to go back. If I were using a paintbrush with that color, it would just paint over everything. I'm going to jump ahead a little here. Uh, and we'll come back to the paint bucket in a second. At some point we want to talk about type tools, so this is a good time to do it. 
group we have four type tools. We're only going to be talking about two of them in the book here. And the first one is a horizontal type tool. And I can drag out a box that I'm going to put type in, text. Right now, see the height of that little line there? That is telling me how tall my letters will be for this particular pixel size. So I'm going to increase that to 60. So I have some nice big text. And I'm just going to type in text tool. Now, if I come back to this paint bucket, and I want to change the background behind that text, what I need to do first is I need to go to the layer that that is on. I know that that's active because the paint bucket icon is showing up. When I was clicked on the text image, you could see there's a symbol telling me I can't do anything there. So I'm coming back to here. And now let's say I want to pick a totally different color. Okay. And now if I click on that background, you can see that that changed, but the text itself was not affected. Okay, I think I've done enough damage to this image that we can move on to something else. And we're going to come over here, we're going to talk about two tools in this group, the Dodge tool and the Burn tool. And I'm going to bring up a, an image to help demonstrate these tools. Dodging and burning are two terms that come over from the days of film photography and the darkroom. And dodging in general means to lighten an area, burning means to make it darker. So I'm going to start off with the dodge tool. And I've got it set for 18% exposure, which means it's going to have about an 18% effect on the exposure. And I also have it noted that I want to look, I want to apply it to areas that are in the shadows right now. So I'm going to start over here. You can see there's some detail here on the side of this cabinet, but I can't really tell what it is. So I'm just going to lightly go over it with this dodge tool. And you can see some kind of shelf. It's beginning to show up. We can also start to see some details of the panels that are on the side of this. And here's another area down here. We can see we have a table and chairs, but we can't really see all the detail there. So I'm just going to brush over it. And each time I brush again, it's going to get a little lighter. And I start to be able to see the full detail of the chairs. And here's another area. And I'm actually going to zoom in on this area so we can see it a little better. Now there's a table back there or something, we think. You can see a salt shaker. Let's see if we can't get a better look at that. So again, I'm going to go to my dodge tool. And I'm just going to brush over this area. And as I do, you'll see some details start to show up. Like this corner of the, the booth. That we really weren't seeing before. And back here on the wall. Anyway, we can show much more detail. And let's see this little wine rack area. We can lighten that up. And see a little bit of that. A little bit on the side here. And even come back in here in the, the bar and lighten that area up a little bit. Now, on the other hand, we can take the dodge uh, or the burn tool and we can darken an area. So I'm going to go to highlights and we can see that this screen is pretty bright. We can darken that pretty quickly. We've got detail here on the ceiling that we can tone down. 
And you can see how it's getting darker just as I pass over. And same thing here with this big window. I'm just toning it down. And also the, uh, the reflection here off the portions of the bar and up here in the top. But you can see where we can very subtly change the exposure in different areas by just dragging this brush over the bright spots. Okay. Put that image back. We'll leave that. And I just want to go to one other image here to just show you what you can do with it. This was an image that I um, shot in daylight without a flash or any kind of auxiliary lighting. And I used the dodge tool to brighten up the central area. And I used the burn tool to sort of put a vignette around it. So it really draws your eyes to the, the spiral growth on this planet. Okay, now we have, we talked a little bit about the type tool, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But we want to come down here to zoom tool, and we're not going to do a whole lot with that, but I do have an image that I can use to help demonstrate a principle here. When you have the zoom tool uh, selected, on the options bar up here, you can see there's the plus and the minus in the magnifying glass, which is pretty typical for zooming in and zooming out. And they work as you would expect. But in Photoshop, you have a couple other options on the options bar here. You can display the image at 100%. You can have it just fit the screen, which means it's going to be the largest image it can before it touches two sides, either the width or the height. And you can have it fill the screen, which means it's the minimum size it could be and totally fill that screen. Now, you can see 100% in this case is actually a little larger than the fill screen and larger than the fit screen. So there are three options you have to very quickly change your image. Now I want to come down to talk about the foreground and the background color. Okay, again, this icon group down here, this is the foreground, this is the background. You can change these by double clicking. So if I, change, if I double click on the foreground, I can come in here and I can just select any color I want. And I can slide up and down the slider here in the color picker until I get something in a range I want. And then pick the exact color. And that becomes my foreground. Likewise, I can do the same thing with the background. Come up here and maybe choose that. So now I have foreground and background that are two different colors and I might be working on a design where I have two dominant colors and this is very convenient because I can use this icon to just toggle back and forth to where the background becomes the foreground and vice versa. And the reason for this is if you're using the paint tool, the paint bucket tool, and several other tools, they will always be applying the foreground color. If you're erasing on a background layer, you'll always be seeing the background color. So you might really care about what, what they are, particularly the foreground color. That comes up much more often. It's also the default color for a lot of situations. So whatever um, the foreground happens to be, often when you do a new type layer, type some text, it will pick up that color. So I'm just going to come, I'm going to cover this whole image with a solid layer. 
I'm going to change, make this the foreground color. And I'm going to type some text here. And you can see it picked that color up, the foreground color up, by default. So that's one situation where the foreground color has significance to what you're doing. And like I said, also the same thing would be if I choose the brush tool. Now we just have a blank white piece of paper, basically. And if I were to type some text here, you'll notice that you don't see anything. Now the reason is because it picked up the foreground color as the default. So first of all, I'm just going to highlight that area where I typed. And I'm going to click up here for the color, text color. And I'm going to change it to this background color. And say OK. And say OK there. So now I have a text layer above my background layer. And I can move that text around wherever I want. I can also come in here and I can double click on the T. And when I do, uh, I can change the size, make it larger, make it smaller, change the font, change the font again, and make it larger. So I can do all kinds of things with that. Now, I'm going to move that over here so we can see it a little better. In the video for Chapter 2, we talked about workspace presets, and one of them has to do with type. So I'm going to come in here just to get some of these tools up here and show you a few things. Now I have the text here. I can select that text, which I'll do by double-clicking here. I can also change the size of this box. And a lot of cases it doesn't matter. Other cases you like it to be a little smaller, more closer to the size of the text. And right now I have it where the text is in the center of the box. You can also put it on the right, put it on the left. But I'm going to leave it right there in the middle. I'm going to click on, say I'm not going to click on that because I want to do some things with it. One of the things I can do is come up here where I can change the spacing. And you can see it's showing the arrow horizontal spacing. If I come here, I can increase it. See it move? I can increase it quite a bit, spread it out even more. I can also decrease it, really cram it together. I can also change the height quite a bit. So again, we were here. I can do even more. Make it longer and narrow and narrow, and I can start spacing this out again. As you can see, I can do quite a bit to change the appearance of that text. Now, I'm going to change. I'm going to change the font. And I'm going to change the height back to 100%. Something a little more familiar to us. And now. I'm going to select this text again. I'm going to come up here. This symbol means to warp the text. And we have all kinds of possibilities for this. So let's say we want to put it in an arc. You'll see immediately that it changes. Plus you have sliders here. So you can change the amount 
of distortion. And you can get some pretty interesting effects with your text that way. It's very easy to change. I can just come back here and again click inside this box and hit it again. I could use a totally different pattern. Um, fish eye. I can bend it around all kinds of ways. So again, you can see we can do quite a few things there with it. Okay, besides creating horizontal text, we can also create vertical text. Again, all I do is type, and it places the letters in a vertical position. So I'm going to click on FX and come down to the bottom, drop shadow. And now this layer style window, we have drop shadows highlighted. So everything in here applies to a drop shadow. So I'm going to take distance and you can see that shadow being created. I can spread it out, I can make it kind of fuzzy. I can continue to play with the distance. I can change the angle. And do all kinds of things with that drop shadow. Also, um, I could do the same thing with the horizontal text. And sometimes that's a little easier to see. Come back down, drop shadow. Change the angle here. And just make some changes in general. Now I'm going to get rid of that drop shadow and I'm going to do something else. I'm going to come up here to bevel and emboss and you'll see that this center, central area changes because that's what's highlighted now. And I'm going to click on contour. I have a choice of contours I can try. Maybe we, we want to make this a bit larger so we can see it better. I'm going to make this 160 points. So we have some large text. And now when we do our effects, bevel on a boss, contour, Okay, you can see we're changing the appearance of the text by using Bevel and Emboss. And now I come back to Contour. And I'm going to choose a different pattern and watch that change again. So I can try out these different patterns and get all kinds of interesting effects. So I get something that I really like. I'd say I just want to stick with that. So I have contour where I like, I have a bevel. I can add a texture to it. You'll see the texture here now. And if I click on that, I have other options for texture. Not too many right now, but I can also import new texture patterns to try out. 
Okay. You can also add a stroke, which is a dark line around the outline. So right now, I'm going to add a bit of a stroke to the outside. I could also add it to the inside. Not so obvious for the center. I'm going to leave it on the outside and I can change the color. I could make that a yellow stroke if I choose. Also have other choices. I can do a color overlay here and and change the opacity of that. As you can see, I can create a lot of different effects by using these combination of items here. I can come back and add my drop shadow again. Now it took a while for it to show up because the stroke was covering it. But there again, I can have as many effects combined as I want. So I can do all kinds of interesting things with text and with special effects and with warping and all the other things that go with text. So there's one more area that I want to go to to discuss before we leave the toolbar. These are shape tools. And what I want to talk about here first is the ellipse. When I click with my cursor and I draw an ellipse, when I release, you can see the circle. But I can come and make, if I make the width and the height the same, I will get a perfect circle instead of an ellipse. So I can make that 478 and now I have a perfect circle and I have a couple details here and right now what it's showing is what's called the fill which is the center part is white I can change that let's make it black and you can see it's now filled with black it also has a stroke on the outside that's this icon here and I can make that something else I can make that yellow and I can also determine how large I want to make it. So I can change the appearance of that circle uh, easily with these sliders. Okay, so this is one way to, to draw solid objects. And I can also go here. Another thing that I can do is I can feather the edge. Feather means to make the edge fuzzy. So I'm going to feather it. And you can see that that's getting very fuzzy now. So you can, again, you can create all kinds of interesting effects with this. So I'm going to close that out. And I want to talk about one other shape tool because we'll use it fairly well. Actually, let's do two, but uh, let's do the line tool. So the line is similar, but you make your adjustments up here on the options bar. So I have a fill that's black and a stroke that's yellow, and I think I'm going to change that just to the opposite. I'll have a fill that's yellow and a stroke that's black. So you notice it got applied to this last shape image I did. I'm going to use it now to draw a line. So when I select this line tool, I have these characteristics and I'm just going to draw a line. And it just looks like a normal line. It's because it's only one pixel wide. So let me make that 20 pixels. And now when I draw a line, you'll see it's different. But it looks like a black line. Now let's make it 50 pixels. And I'll draw a line. 
And again, it looks black. But it's because the stroke is so large. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to turn that stroke down. And now you'll see I have a yellow line with a black border. So I can use this to make, to draw lines that are visible in different backgrounds by using a, a fill color that, that I want and a uh, border around it, the stroke color, to make it stand out from its background. And I can draw these lines any direction I want. Okay. The next one I want to do down here is the custom shape tool. And in this particular case, it's going to create an arrow. And by how I drag this out, that arrow will change quite a bit. And because I have a fill and a stroke already chosen, it'll give me a yellow arrow with a black border. Now, if I want to change that arrow, I can come up here to, I can select the arrow. And I can come up to Edit, Transform, Free Transform. And now I can turn that any way I want. And I can use my Move tool. and use my move tool to move it around to exactly what I want to point to. Now we had talked before about foreground and background color and mentioned how you can use this toggle to switch back and forth. The other thing is that we often want to go to the default color. Now we can do the default either by clicking on this small icon up here which are immediately changes it to a black foreground, white background, or we can hit the letter D on our keyboard to do the exact same thing. The reason that the one of the reasons that the default is black and white is that when we get into layer mass, you'll see that that's very beneficial to be able to switch back and forth from black to white. And layer masks are a big part of Photoshop. Okay, we've come all the way down the toolbar. We have the Move tool, which we've talked about, and we just demonstrated. We have the Selection tools, which we use to make different selections. We have our Crop tool, which we demonstrated how to crop an image and how to use different preset crop situations. Um, we talked about the Spot Healing Brush tool. We talked about the brush tool, the paintbrush tool, to be able to paint all kinds of interesting things. We did some cloning. We used the eraser tool briefly. We did several things with the paint bucket to fill areas. We did some dodging and burning to change the exposure and images to lighten some areas and darken others. We did a little, some work with text tools. And we work with shape tools, and we also work with the zoom tool, and the foreground and background color. So we should have a pretty good um, understanding of the tool bar by now. And as we start working on the various lessons and the, the other chapters, we'll be drawing on all these, and these will become more understandable as you begin to use them in real life situations, practical situations. So I'm going to call it quits for now as far as the toolbar goes, and I'll catch up with you in the next lesson. Thanks for watching.